morning everyone uh, we are here on a yet another a beautiful winter morning in bangalore and uh, we are here as part of the international playback theater networks conference happening in christ deemed to be university playback theater is a very interesting format uh, it uses a lot of uh, improv mechanism wherein they draw stories from the audience and then share it back to them so they perform it to the audience what's more interesting now at the moment is that we have got the founders of playback theater jonathan fox and joe salas with us these are extremely warm friendly and uh, unassuming people and it's a pleasure to have this kind of an interview running welcome to this edition of uh, the international playback theater interview thank you thank you we would love to know how this whole uh, playback theater movement was initiated i'm sure uh, this is somewhere uh, 45 years back uh, in history and mm. uh, you would uh, have a lot of stories to share about uh, how it was all founded uh, you would have had your own uh, trials and tribulations challenges and wonderful experiences over the years uh, if you could go back to those foundation moments and share it uh, we would love to hear that you can ask that since you are the <laughs> well it's the, um, the the idea for playback theater um was just a vision of a group of people um in a audience and actors sitting in front of them on a stage and it was clear in the vision that the someone from the audience would be telling a story one of their own stories and the actors would act that out and Joe and I were already um involved in a theater company okay. but we decided we would create something new mm -hmm. to see if we could develop this idea okay so uh, to your surprise uh, both of them are uh, husband and wife and uh, we would also like to know how this relationship led into the founding of uh, playback theater so um yeah so we, when when we began playback we were young couple we had one child and soon we had another and um and uh we had been together for a number of years although yeah we got what well, got together when we were very very young and uh we had um I'm I'm a New Zealander okay. and Jonathan's American we had met in New Zealand and um then had various adventures around the world before we began our family life in in the United States and uh we had both come from um kind of artistic backgrounds right. and uh, backgrounds in in the arts and in literature mm -hmm. um Jonathan to some degree in theater okay. um I was more focused in music and writing and painting okay. um but our in interest in 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 the arts was was a a shared interest right. um I also had always had an interest in um uh political action activism um okay. since I was a young teenager and and uh so that was always there at least in the background as we as we began mm -hmm. that this this idea of inviting people to um tell their stories was okay. was a a very um fundamentally kind of democratic idea right. that um people's voices could be heard in this way and that that could lead to um dialogue and connection and making space for voices that are not so often heard. Okay. So some of our very earliest performances were for um people who whose stories are not necessarily listened to, mm -hmm. for example, chil children, children right. in a hospital. Okay. You know, so children children have a lot to say and uh they don't often get listened to with great attention or right. respect. So that was sort of part of the the vision from the beginning. Okay. <coughs> Another aspect of it was that that I was very interested in improvisation. Mhm. Mm no planning. Okay. No script. Okay. Scriptless theater. Okay. And uh, most improvisation as it developed in the United States was comic, satirical. Okay. But I wanted um to see if we could develop a kind of improvisation that um could have deep and serious emotions mm -hmm. as well as happy and funny emotions that okay. the stories we n knew people wanted to tell were often quite serious so could right. we use improvisation uh in this fuller <coughs> range right. and that's what we started to work on okay so if i understand right you let your creative uh, skills and uh, social visions come together in the form of uh, a new 
theatrical form called playback theater. Correct. Exactly. Right. And, you know, from in the very beginning, <clears throat> that combination of um, an artistic impulse and a, a social impulse, if you, right. if you can call it that, yeah. um, it, it attracted other people who, who also wanted to, you know, express themselves artistically, but, but to do something beyond theatre itself. And to this day, playback attracts people in right. that way. Right. You know, people who have an artistic sensibility, right. but, but are not satisfied simply to do theatre for theatre's sake, mm -hmm. which I completely support theatre for theatre's sake. Okay. But, um, I mean, I love theatre mm -hmm. and the arts, but um, some of us are just constitutionally um, not satisfied with that. We want, we want our art to serve a purpose beyond mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And um, there, it turns out there are many people who share that kind of Absolutely. combined desire. Right. So we could now mm -hmm. call playback theater a form of applied theater, okay. which, which means a theater that is developed uh, for a community purpose, mm -hmm. um, as Joe says, not just for the theater itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there are now many kinds of uh, applied theater, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most common is theater of the oppressed, for example, uh, which I know yeah. is widely yeah. practiced mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. um, when we started in 1975, that was before <coughs> Augusto Boal had published his first book. Oh, um, okay. So once um, theater of the oppressed, his book came out, mm -hmm. we had already been going for three or four years, and the ideas, uh, his ideas connected very much with some of ours. Okay. Um, but Theatre of the Oppressed, as one example, has a very strong um, political and social agenda. Right. Uh, so Joe is talking about activism, um, but our activism took a slightly different direction. Right. Because we didn't have a narrative agenda. Whatever anybody <coughs> wanted to tell, mm -hmm. um, our concern was to listen respectfully right. and to put it on the stage in a way that the teller Mm -hmm. could nod and say, yes, that is my story, but also the audience could recognize right. the story. Right. Uh, theater as a, a form has a very old, I mean, very long history and running back to uh, maybe thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the foremost art forms, uh, which has continued to thrive even today. And it's more of a communitarian experience. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not something uh, that's removed from the receiver. So it is something that mm -hmm. is live and has a lot of enabling possibilities. Now, there are many, many theatre forms that are practiced across the world. For instance, in the very state that we are here, um, that is Karnataka, we have <coughs> more than 300 <coughs> theatre forms. Amazing. Traditional mm. art forms yeah. to uh, yeah. proscenium yeah. kind of ones and all that. Mm. Yeah. So how do you locate playback theatre in this kind of a mix? When there are so many theatrical forms, uh, how do you mm. uh, distinguish uh, playback yeah. as a theatre form? So, yeah. Yeah. Well. I sometimes think of playback theater as a modern form of oral traditional Wonderful. theater. Okay. Um, and actually, the literature I studied were the old, old stories. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had the, uh, after I had gone to New Zealand and met Joe, okay. which changed my life, <laughs> I. And for many others, of course. <laughs> I volunteered in Nepal. I was in the American Peace Corps okay. in a very tiny village in Nepal for two years. Mm -hmm. And this was before the idea of playback theater, but this mm -hmm. village life in Nepal um, you know, changed my ideas. Okay. And it's not that there was specific this form or that form that um, influenced me directly, but it was the general way of life, this mm -hmm. oral traditional way of life. And mm -hmm. on a holiday day, what would happen and the kind of dances right. and the the way people would respond in the intimacy of it, right. um, that um, that influenced playback theater a great deal. And okay. uh, for example, in the village, you know, you you have to suit the performance to the weather. Mm -hmm. For example, right. well, playback theater um, <coughs> is also based on this idea of attunement. Mm -hmm. um, for example, each time we perform, we have to feel the mood of the audience. Right. We, we have to fit in with the conditions. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's dusty or if it's windy, okay. uh, we have to adjust. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are many ways that um, this experience in Nepal, this touch with the 
with the real oral tradition right. influence this modern uh, creation. Right. Yes. And, and I would say, of course, we've developed our own very specific ritual and right. protocols and forms and so on, um, sort of structures which mm -hmm. are probably have something in common with some other forms of theatre, but they're uh, the ones that we've particularly developed. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but another thing that I think may be somewhat unique to playback mm -hmm. is the kind of um, atmosphere right. that we create. And because, yes. because we genuinely co-create with the audience, mm -hmm. we simply do not have a performance yes. unless they join us. Right. And in order for that to happen, we have to be skillful in mm -hmm. creating an atmosphere mm -hmm. of, of um, both trust and yep. excitement, you yep. know, so someone feels comfortable but all, also feels, yes, I want to raise my hand and, and tell a story. Yep. Yep. And that's not, you know, it takes skill to, to yep. be able to do that. But what results is um, an atmosphere that's... Um, that's safe, um, but has this kind of quality of um, in intimacy and mm -hmm. authenticity. Right. And so we do want to be skillful performers. We want it to be an artistic expression, an artistic experience, but we don't want it to be so polished and full of bells and whistles right. that we distance the people in the audience. So we want them to feel like they could be us. Yep. You know, we could be them, they could be us. Yep. And so there's a kind of informality about it, right. which is very important. And I think it can be a trap sometimes right. to go too much towards okay. high production values, okay. you know, because in the end that will push the audience away. Right. Right. I mean, people will just sit back and, you know, enjoy the show rather than feeling like they are integrally part of it. So it's, it's, it's informal in that mm -hmm. sense, but not casual. Mm -hmm. There's nothing casual about it. Okay. There's, yeah. a, there's a ritual, there's a, um, a, a sort of sacredness okay. about it, yeah. but, but it's completely accessible. And I, I could just <coughs> add that um, how to build this atmosphere is something, a whole different set of skills that we also had to learn. So right. all of this took some time. Yeah. Also. There are a lot of beautiful aspects about playback theatre, but uh, one of the most uh, interesting and uh, very observable element about playback theatre is the way in which uh, you draw the stories from the audience. Mm -hmm. right? So audience is treated with respect <coughs> and there is safety that is yes. assured for them for sharing what they have gone through. So uh, how was this envisioned? I would like to know what were the spurs that led to having this kind of a format laid out. Um. Well, we, it was trial and error okay. yes, in the yes. beginning. I yes. mean, we honestly, we, we came together, Jonathan and I, and this kind of motley crew of about 12 people, exactly. you know, meeting in a, a church hall okay. in a small town. And like, here's the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what do we do? You know, we just began telling each other's stories, uh, you know, telling our own stories. And, mm -hmm. and then we soon began to see what was necessary and what worked and what didn't work. We tried all kinds of things. We were... Most of us were fairly young. We were. Okay. It was the mid '70s. It was a crazy time. Okay. Lots of experimental theatre going on, right. and um, lots of iconoclasm going on. And mm -hmm. we tried all kinds of things. You mm -hmm. might be a little shocked right. to know what some of the things were that we. Would you we like tried. to share? Things? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but but what emerged from that was was forms and so on that that worked. Okay. And then we also discovered in terms of building that atmosphere with the audience mm -hmm. what worked mm -hmm. and when we look back we both can remember times when when it didn't work okay. egregiously you know when right. we would be challenged by someone from the audience mm -hmm. and looking back it's clear that that happened because we were not we didn't yet know how to establish the safety and the sense it's like a felt sense right. that informal as it seems there are rules here. There are things that we do and there are things that we don't do. Right. And that's to create the safety. Right. And, and people sense that and they follow that. And we don't get that kind of um, you know, disruption right. now right. because we know how to create that right. atmosphere. Right. 
Yeah. But many mistakes were made along the way. Okay. It's hard to believe uh, considering uh, the way in which the playback <coughs> theatre is now performed across the world and yes. it seems to work uh, quite so well. I mean, it's surprising that uh, yes. you had to yes. have those kind of experiences uh, yes. which enabled this kind of uh, yes. perfection yeah. of perfecting yeah. of yes. the whole process. And it's a very grassroots process because right. um, someone saw it and then took it back to their town or their country or their city and right. tried to do it themselves. And um, one comment I wanted to make um, is that in the very beginning, if someone told a story, and we, w we always, even now, we will check with them afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, not did we get everything, because right. that's impossible, but did we capture the essence of what you intended to share with us? And sometimes in the beginning, they would say, no, was, uh, you missed the important part. And then we would say, OK, we'll do it again, and we can correct it. Right. And now we almost never do that. Right. And, and the reason is, is that uh, first of all, the actors are much more skillful at mm -hmm. hearing mm -hmm. right, right. and embodying on the stage. But secondly, we learned this amazing thing, which is that that if something is unfulfilled or incomplete mm -hmm. in one story, somehow the next teller will tell something that will um, enable that that story to complete the one before. Right. So we don't have to correct this one because we know the next one will actually do the correction. Right. I would like to slightly disagree with uh, one of the points that you made. Yeah. You call it to be uh, an active sense of listening. Yes. But I'm sorry, uh, hearing. Uh, yeah. Uh, but if I understand it right, uh, it's more of listening because it's mm -hmm. not just about yes. getting the information, but there is also a lot of uh, uh, empathy yes. involved. Yes. And uh, yes. right. there is a personal connect that uh, you establish yes. with the audience. And I think uh, uh, that's yes. an amazing uh, aspect about Absolutely. playback right. theatre. Yeah. And that, I think that's what, what, what strikes people more than anything, I mean, the comments that people people make and uh, something we're very conscious about is the role of listening, mm -hmm. and that um, we are very deliberately um, listening. We call it whole body listening, not just okay. with our ears, but with our literally. Listening. I mean, yeah. you, you sort of open your body mm -hmm. to hearing what the teller is saying, yeah. and you're not ideally you're not thinking, you're not planning, mm -hmm. you're just taking it in. And it's a very rare experience in, yeah. in society now to be listened to in, yeah. the, in that way. And so our modeling of that mm -hmm. helps the audience to also listen very fully to what, what the, the teller is saying. And you're right, it's not passive hearing. Right. It's right. like intentionally, um, you know, I'm going to open myself right. to what you yeah. tell us. Also, I, I just want to go back for sure, a moment sure. to what to this um, question about, you know, you said that um, it, the way playback is now, it doesn't seem like the, yeah, we, did, we made all these the past, mistakes. Yeah. But we did, I, you know, because we identified what are the key things that make it work, mm -hmm. we began teaching playback okay. fairly early on, mm -hmm. and that's been an evolving process. Right. But we were able to transmit what we had learnt were the key elements okay. so that other people didn't have to make okay. the same mistakes okay. and we continue to refine that you know to make it um, clearer and clearer like what are the essential things we need to do for this process mm -hmm. to work and so that's the, the training aspect is very important okay. and this commitment to <coughs> deep listening <coughs> is the basis of the ethics of playback theater and it's a commitment to human dignity. Right. Um, and it's also really the... So we, we want everyone involved mm -hmm. to feel positive about it. Mm -hmm. So this is very challenging. Right. You know, it's very different from traditional theater. The, um, it, it's not part of the ethics of traditional theater that the actor necessarily feels wonderful afterwards. Yes. They just have to do their show. Right. Um, but um, in playback theater, we want the teller to feel positive. We want the audience to feel positive and even the actors to feel positive. Um, and I also feel that this commitment to deep listening, as Joe has suggested, is the root of the social activism of playback mm -hmm. theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the uh, things uh, that I'm curious to uh, uh, know is the way in which, uh, as actors, uh, people go back to kind of a neutral zone. Yeah. wherein uh, they clear off whatever clutter that is there in their mind and start looking at things 
in terms of what is happening at the moment uh, being yes. alive to the moment yes. and uh, not having mm-hmm. any preoccupied yes. thoughts itself mm-hmm. is a huge yes. challenge mm-hmm. so uh, yes. mm-hmm. how do you train your people yes. to mm-hmm. get this yes. done yes, yes. yes. Yeah. yeah um it, it it's just it's a pr- probably more more a question of intention than mm-hmm. anything so you you realize when you start doing playback that that's what you need to do mm-hmm. that you if you if your mind is too busy if you're distracted if you're even thinking about oh what what clever thing am i going to do when i okay. get on stage yeah yeah it's a trap right and um and you soon realize that you actually can't do a good job if you, right. if you do that so yeah. gradually people learn as they do it right. in you know in rehearsals or in training workshops to um to get to that clear place right. and and then you have to keep coming back to that in during a performance for example you do a story you're deeply involved in the story the story okay. might be very emotionally intense okay. and then it's over teller goes back to the audience mm-hmm. you have to let that go yeah. and yeah. you have to let go the worry that maybe you didn't do a good job yeah. Yeah. you know and be open to the next story so yeah. we do get quite good it's like you know a gymnast mm-hmm. strengthening particular muscles we get okay. good at strengthening okay. that muscle okay. of emptying ourselves and being open. Okay, so there's a warming up and a warming down kind of uh, yes. activity that is involved with regard to playback theater. Absolutely. Right. And and yeah. so uh, this yeah, mentally these yes. things yes. well these things yes. some people ask us sometimes well how do you practice this because mm-hmm. it is so spontaneous. But what Joe's talking about is one of the things we practice. Um for example, how do you sit on the stage mm-hmm. and can you be natural mm-hmm. but attentive? Yep. and and it's not easy and right. and um you know it's easy to get distracted it's easy to show your worry um and and that kind of thing yeah. um also the audience may not warm up to the idea of sharing some of their personal experiences uh, with a new set of people who are there on stage of course they've right. paid and they've come to watch and all right. that but then uh, how do you initiate them to open up i mean that would be a challenge yeah. but uh, well it's it's a process that, that yeah. we've learned okay. uh, so we would never ask for a A, a big story right away. Okay. Uh we asked for lots of little small things um and um you know we w- I won't describe all the details mm-hmm. but um there are many many aspects to it. Okay. You know how the actors enter, how they might introduce themselves. Mm-hmm. The music is very important. Right. Okay. Uh so slowly somebody who might start saying, you know, what is this strange mm-hmm. thing? um after 25 minutes okay. their hand starts to go up because they can't help themselves ah, uh, okay uh, so it's a kind of rite of passage right. where somebody is drawn in okay yeah we do in the when the actors introduce themselves typically um most of the time not always typically the act the performers including the conductor usually it, they introduce themselves with a fragment of their own story mm-hmm and that is doing a number of things it's like planting seeds of stories right. in the audience and it's sharing the actor's vulnerability and humanity mm-hmm. and then it's modeling the playback process because they say something and the other actors bring it to life for a mm-hmm. moment mm-hmm. so they're seeing the process and then as soon as they begin answering questions from the conductor and they're always going to be very simple easy to answer questions like you know how is your day so okay. far today okay. um the audience sees that um their response is treated with respect mm-hmm. and listened to mm-hmm. and it's delightful because they see something artistic um made out of their sharing and it, it, as Jonathan saying it's kind of incremental right so bit by bit they see this is how it works they're not going to be exploited or made fun of mm-hmm. um and they're beginning to um bubble with things that they want right. to speak up about right also the other thing is uh, <coughs> um as audience uh, we are likely to find it uh, absolutely incredible that uh, the whole team is thinking as one and there is a mix mm-hmm. of uh, artistic uh, things coming into the picture for instance there is music at work uh, there is bodily performance then there is song that could be brought in sometimes dance movements there is so much happening there so uh, yes. if you could tell us uh, yes. how the whole process is well done. so so mm-hmm. that element of teamwork uh is is speaks to the audience mm-hmm. um and 
there are playback theater groups. How, how many years your group? Thir almost 30. Almost 30 years. Oh, the, the okay. Groups tend to, s to exist for a long time. So, so the this whole group is, stays together. Yeah, this is very different. So this is really inspired by the experimental theater model of an ensemble, mm -hmm. or in dance, for example, okay. you have an ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, and very different from traditional <coughs> theater, these ensembles are permanent ensembles. They mm -hmm. It's not just for a season. Right. They stay together. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the members um, stay for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And uh, as these years pass where you're working with the same people, mm -hmm. um, responding physically to the challenges, you get actually um, closer and closer and yep. more creative with each other. Right. And it's kind of been proven um, scientifically that um, improvisers who have this kind of deep practice, okay. uh, there's almost like there's no leader. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. At least as an audience, I, I yeah. couldn't sense mm -hmm. that. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. I was just amazed that uh, people are thinking as one, coming together, yeah. and there is almost like a symphony happening. And so yes. it's yeah. all well yes. without a coordinator, I mean, a yes. conductor. Yes, yes. So that's without a conductor and without yeah. a script. Right. Without yeah. a and yeah. score. And it does, it does somewhat come back to the listening. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're all listening in the same way. Um, so w with with my company, I'm I'm often but not always the conductor. Mm -hmm. um, but I know when I so hear. So there is a conductor, but not the, oh, so yeah, evident a, for the audience. Well, yes. we we always have a, the conductor who's the who's the interfaces with the audience. Okay. okay. We always do that. Okay. Do have okay. that, yeah. But once the enactment starts, there's no one directing it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and the conductor doesn't tell the actors how okay. to do it. The okay. actors create that themselves. Okay. Um, but as a conductor, I know for sure mm -hmm. that the actors are hearing the story the same way that I am. Yeah. And, um, you know, for that reason, in, in, in my company, I I'd never, we don't, the conductor does not tell the actors what form to use. Mm -hmm. The actors decide. Mm -hmm. And um, they, we're, we're all likely to be thinking of the same yep. form, and we trust that. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to just make a comment <coughs> about playback is really an intimate form of theatre yeah. in the sense that some of these things we're talking about, um, it's quite hard to achieve it if you have an audience of um, 500 yeah. or 1,000. Yeah. Uh, it's just too... Uh, people can't relax and you don't have a sense of, of, of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in an audience of 50 or 100 or 150, depending on the hall, mm -hmm. uh, then you can build this kind of connection and safety. Okay. Um, nevertheless, um, even in the smallest audience, um, the playback performance is a public yeah. Um, ceremony, yeah. uh, and people are telling private experiences, yeah. but in a public setting. Yeah. So there is risks involved there. Right. Um, they could, in fact, regret that they told. Mm -hmm. They could feel exposed. Uh, they could feel um, insulted in some yeah. way. Um, but there's also the potential for healing yeah. and uh, being a feeling of being understood and mm -hmm. feeling not so alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the connect is so well established because I see in some of the performances that uh, people who have had very uh, bad experiences uh, in their childhood, uh, yes. which they haven't even cared to share with their family members or friends, are now willing to open up and share it with yes. uh, mm -hmm. a public uh, and yes. that to, uh, uh, yes. to some of the strangers. Yes. And that's the amazing way in which playback uh, yes. seems to trigger the right kind of... Uh, Yes. Yes. Emotions for the right kind of yes. objectives, of course. So I it's mean, as, so, go ahead. Sorry, as it, it's very important that that's another reason why it's extremely important to have this atmosphere of intimacy and authenticity, mm -hmm. because what we do not want is the kind of reality show, talk show atmosphere mm -hmm. where people um, come and bear their soul in order yes. to be sensational. Right. That's not what we do, and right. that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. We want people to feel genuinely um, drawn to share something that's important to them um, and that, that is the right time for them to do that. Yeah. So someone who's been traumatized, mm -hmm. there is a moment in their healing, there is a stage in their healing where it's, it's the right thing to do, it's the appropriate thing to do yeah. to share it in a public or semi-public way. Yeah. I mean, this is a, a clinical, clinically... Um, documented that right. at a certain point, not right at, 
not when a trauma is fresh, but mm -hmm. at some point to be able to say to mm -hmm. other people, this happened to me, okay. and for them to get the response directly or indirectly, we hear you, okay. we understand, this was wrong, okay. you are right to tell us. Okay. So th it's a very profound thing when that happens, mm -hmm. but it's essential that it happens in this atmosphere of, yeah. of authenticity and spontaneity. Mm. Are there any uh, pros and cons, I mean, um, a kind of a guidelines, principles mm. uh, that you share with the actor stating that uh, these are uh, lines that should not be crossed and this is how we exercise our own cultural sensitivity uh, we, I mean, you would have some amount of uh, certain guiding principles, if you could tell us what those are. Well, um, guidelines in a general way, okay. but it's much too complicated to have rules okay. In, in, okay. in this kind of thing. But right. for Especially example... in an artistic context, yeah. Well, this is not the artist... It, it, it involves the artistic, but it's actually questions of character. Right. Um, so you need to be committed to your own growth as a person mm -hmm. uh, so when you talk about cultural differences yes. if somebody we all have prejudices yep. if we're not willing to um, kind of confront our prejudices and work through our prejudices for sure on the stage we're going to make a mistake yeah um, and so um, the people involved in playback theater have a responsibility to know themselves um, this is just one yeah. one kind of example okay. to work with themselves right. you know to, so we very consciously <clears throat> um, challenge ourselves to work on you know our awareness of race and racism for example mm -hmm. and sexism and right. um, if and if we're performing for a particular population group we take the responsibility of, of studying the background and yeah. building relationships in that yeah. community and so on so yeah. we we take our social responsibility very right. seriously. Yeah. There could also be other challenges that could just suddenly pop up. For instance, sure. uh, there are stories uh, that you don't uh, approve of and which are actually, uh, as you were referring to, uh, racially yes. uh, on a yes. Yes. track that you don't approve of. And yes. Do you okay. choose to say no to certain stories? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, th so playback theory is based on respect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Theoretically, we should respect this person also, even yep. th though they may be very prejudiced. Or, right, right. Um, but we, we have learned of, to balance respect with fairness. Mm -hmm. Fairness uh, to not just this teller, but to uh, everyone who's there, and yep. even perhaps some people who are not there, mm -hmm. uh, so that um, the actors are going to enact the story. There, there are a number of ways we deal with it. Yep. It's not just one way, but yep. one way would be to enact a story that may um, honor what the teller says, mm -hmm. but also show. We, we're not willing to objectify mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a person or a yeah. kind of person on the stage. Yeah. We're not going to be manipulated by this teller. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't usually send him away. Okay. We would okay. not say, your view is a bad view, right. because right. We, we can't make those judgments yeah. always. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I actually, I just had a conversation with one of the Indian groups about this question. Okay. And I'm not going to say much about, you know, their particular situation, but they're doing some extremely difficult and challenging work where okay. this comes up a lot mm -hmm. in a, the most intense, imaginable mm -hmm. way. And so we were we were talking about this very question. And, okay. um, and there are a number of very specific techniques mm -hmm. that we can use when mm -hmm. the teller is telling a story that's morally problematic. Right, right. So we have to find this very delicate balance, as Jonathan was saying, between honoring the tellers and the teller's story, but also maintaining our own moral values mm -hmm. and hopefully creating a situation in which this person can learn something yep. and and understand the humanity of the person that they're Right. Um, mistreating. Yeah. They might not think that they're mistreating them, right. but we want the enactment to, the whole process to, yeah. to open something yeah. in them and in people who might share their view mm -hmm. and for the people in the audience who might be hurt by their position, we, it's very important that they know yeah. we do not share that prejudice. Yeah.
I, yes. I just want to We're give We're not one. morally neutral. Right, right. I, I wanted to give an example. It's impossible as well. Yeah. 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 I want to give an example also <laughs> from this conference. Okay. I have to be a little bit vague about it because I don't expose right. the, the teller without permission. Fair enough. But um, again, a story that was questionable morally. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm in the audience and I'm listening and I'm thinking, you know, I'm starting to get a bit... Um, critical and nervous right. and the conductor who's interviewing this teller before it goes to the stage mm -hmm. kind of just stayed with the teller and asked another question and another question okay. and um, after a minute everything changed mm -hmm. and the story became a very vulnerable story okay. that was so beautiful okay. so this was kind of that was the inside okay. and, mm -hmm. and it ended up being you know a very 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 um, wonderful story. So there is yeah. a beauty in the way in which uh, the whole process is pregnant with multiple possibilities that yes. we yes. may not yes. be able to even sense yes. in what yes. direction yeah. it's going yes. to yes. go. Yeah. There's uh, always uh, complexity. Right. And, and, right. and I will say that it's very, very rare, but mm -hmm. there are one or two times where personally I have mm -hmm. sent somebody back. Okay. Uh, and it, it's a time when they refuse to... You know, when one time was somebody said, I want to see you make a a cheese sandwich, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, we're not here to do cheese sandwiches." Okay. And and I tried to help that person go find their story, and and that person refused to, to okay. insisted on the cheese sandwich. And, okay. And I said goodbye. Okay. And and I would say that was probably one of the examples in our early mm -hmm. years when we we hadn't yet learnt the skills to yeah, create maybe. an atmosphere right. of such. Mm -hmm respect mm -hmm. and genuineness that um, you know no no one's going to do that I mean yep. these days no one would do that mm -hmm. yeah but back doubt. then it was we were a little rough around the edges okay. and and okay. and and people would very occasionally yeah. you know challenge, challenge us. us or manipulate right. us and and uh, fortunately that doesn't happen now yeah. So I understand that uh, playback is played in uh, a variety of contexts it's played in uh, different countries different regions different communities uh, and also in a lot of crisis context. Yes. So if you could yes. uh, enlighten us by sharing in what yes. kind of context playback is now yes. being... So maybe mm -hmm. you could talk about your company work a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, welcome. yeah. yeah so the, this, um, I mean, I, I hear, we hear all the time about wonderful projects mm -hmm. um, all over the world, and including many in India. I mean, mm -hmm. India has been a pioneer in many ways in, in using playback for for social justice, okay. and um, you know there are experts that you could talk to right right here sure. who would have wonderful stories to tell you. Sure. Um, so in, in in our context, we we live um, near New York City, but not right. not in the city in a small a region of small towns. Mm -hmm. um, one of the um, one of the projects that, that we've been involved in is working with immigrants in our area. Mm -hmm. So as in most parts of the United States, there are many immigrants who come mostly from Latin America. Mm -hmm. Many of them come without visas. They mm -hmm. come because they're compelled to come. They're, they're facing um, often great physical danger from mm -hmm. violence. They're facing extreme poverty, mm -hmm. lack of opportunity, lack of education. Um, much of which is directly or indirectly caused by the United States mm -hmm. political actions in the past, mm -hmm. um, and so they they come across the border um, without a visa if they can't get a visa, okay. and it can take fifty years to get a visa. Um, so if you have a starving child, okay. what's your moral responsibility? Mm. You know. Your responsibility is to save that child, not to wait until you can get a legal visa. So our position is that they deserve to be here. We want to welcome them, and we want to give them a, a, a forum in which to share their stories. Um, so we, we conceived this project a number of years ago in talking to um, people who um, ran a, a, a big um, government-funded preschool, and many of the parents were these immigrant parents, and so mm -hmm. they got to know the parents, and they were very struck by how isolated they were and how mm -hmm. difficult their lives were, mm -hmm. and they asked us to 
to offer them playback. Yeah. And it built, ended up a project project where we did hundred and something performances over a number of years. Oh, wonderful. And um, in preparation for that, we spent a year um, building relationships in the community, mm -hmm. um, learning the, the, the background, the history of this situation. Mm -hmm. And then we did these bilingual performances. Many of them don't speak English. Okay. And um, so we had a translator. We had bilingual actors, mm -hmm. and it it from what the participants told us, it was tremendously meaningful mm -hmm. to them to be able to to voice their stories yep. for each other. Yeah. For their children, mm -hmm. it was like they were building a new mythology. Mm -hmm. You know, this is who we are. Mm. This is how we came. Yeah. This is why we came. Mm. This is what it's like being here. And I think they're also telling us we were kind of representatives of the yeah. majority culture. Yeah. And um, they wanted us to tell other people. They wanted us to share their stories beyond. Mm. And um, it was it was a wonderfully rewarding project for us. Mm -hmm. um, there were many tears, many very emotional stories. At one point one woman said, um, it makes us sad to remember mm -hmm. but happy to see it. Yeah. Um, so that was one major project and we, we completed that but now in this current era with our current political situation, immigrants are under attack. Mm -hmm. um, even more than they were before. Mm. And so we're starting to do this again, um, to offer playback as a way for people to right. um, connect with each other and connect to sympathetic people in the, in the, in the community. Yeah. So if I understand right, playback gives a platform for untold stories, separate stories to be heard yes. and shared. Yes. With. Yes. yes, a variety of people yes. from other backgrounds. Yes, yes. And, and, and in the, in this yeah. case, um, simply telling and sharing the stories in itself was a form of activism, mm -hmm. um, a form of moving in the direction of justice. Yeah. Um, in other contexts, we we link it more directly with um, pra pragmatic things like. Mm -hmm with the climate change performances that we do, mm -hmm. we link it very directly with opportunities to, to take action. Mm -hmm. Somebody can walk out of there and, 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 and do something. Okay. But with the many other situations, including the immigrant stories shows, um, we weren't, the, the, ac the action was the, the playback itself. I wanted to just um, <clears throat> add, you, you mentioned, um, crises, yes. community crises, yes. and uh, at the beginning, although we wanted to uh, ha have a place where people could tell any story, we had no particular interest in tra trauma yeah. or these stories of great suffering. But as people began to respond to the atmosphere, they started telling their mm -hmm. very deep stories or yeah. something that they would never have told anybody. Mm -hmm. And so we began to learn how to do those mm -hmm. stories. And um, so as as certain crises developed around the world, whether, whether it would be a mm -hmm. natural disaster mm -hmm. or civil disturbance, um, playback became a, one of the choices. Um, to give you an example, um, in Japan, after the um, earthquake and tsunami mm -hmm. and the Fukushima disaster, um, playback was used um, in Fukushima okay. to uh, help people who had lost everything and were living just in temporary housing mm -hmm. um, tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as Joe has already said, it's it seemed really important for them to have a chance to tell their stories. And in many contexts in the world, even in a place like Japan, they're not going to organize a therapist for everybody. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to provide. Uh, and, and somehow this public sharing gives people great relief. Yep. Um, their identity has been shattered by the disaster, yep. and they can rebuild their identity by narrative Tizing right. their experience. So it's almost like an emotional hand holding. Yes, <coughs> yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. There's also this element of 
just public testimony, you know. So these people after natural disasters, mm -hmm. um, they they tell the world what yeah. what it was like yeah. to be inside that, yeah. you know. It's we need a, to know. It's also a kind of an oral documentation of the entire yes. process. Absol yeah. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. one other, so to talk about just uh, civil conflict, um, playback is a way also where people can, can f with different perspectives, mm -hmm. um, can share their story and the other side can hear a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy mm -hmm. yeah. to get everyone in the same room mm -hmm. is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um, but um, stories are always... Um, showing different perspectives yeah. and and this element of listening um, then can work to yeah. build peace where there was yeah. war yeah so where all in the world is playback theater now operational where in the world well there are 60 yep. i think 65 countries Whoa. Uh, it's hard to count okay because they come and you know we'll hear okay there's playback in the maldive islands you know mm -hmm. but we don't know how long okay they and there are undoubtedly lots of groups that we okay. we, don't, we don't happen to know about. Okay. You know, we're not the official recorders of yeah. where, but something like sixty-five or okay. yeah. And okay. and perhaps it's important <coughs> to say that from the beginning we were very mm -hmm. um, we didn't try to control mm -hmm. uh, the growth and development. Okay. Uh, people did not have to franchise with us. We did not profit from it. Okay. Um, it was a very grassroots natural development. Okay. Um, so one of the weak sides of that okay. is we don't always know okay. who and where. Okay. The IPTN, the International Network, um, works to help people stay connected. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a little fluid and okay. Joe and I ourselves, right. we're the founders, but we don't necessarily know everywhere okay. right. that it's practiced. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful listening to uh, both of you. Uh, and. Uh, it's a rich set of ideas about how theatre can be used for social context in a very proactive way. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if we desire a better world uh, and if we hope that our, whether our art can change the uh, world that is outside theatre, uh, then uh, playback theatre's response is perhaps, yes, we could. Yeah. Thank you so much for being wonderful uh, members over here and for sharing all your thoughts with us. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank so you for much. listening. Thank you. <laughs> Our pleasure. Thank you.